So, um, so looking forward to getting to and talking about some dark web aspects today and looking at the other side, um, a little bit around network attribution and some of the deeper considerations around that. And then some of the ways we can automate collecting and monitoring, you know, so looking at some of the different approaches to the dark web. A little bit of background about uh, myself and my company first. Uh, Chris Polder, I'm the founder and CEO of OSIN Combine. I come from a military background uh, and we're an Australian veteran owned and operated business who specialize in providing enduring or developing enduring open source intelligence capability within organizations. And we do that across uh, training software and services with our flagship platform Nexus Explorer and then some of our uh, training offerings to provide fundamental capability within organizations. Um, let's get into what we all came here to speak. If you're uh, uh, looking at the, the dark website, we're going to break it down into two particular areas. So part one is going to be looking at understanding the network a little bit closer and then how attribution may work from a different perspective uh, and safe access options. And then part two, we're going to look at less around exploring the dark web and more around how do we set up automation to create scale and efficiency when we need to monitor and keep an eye on things in the dark web, which go up and down and can sometimes be hard to sort of access. So key takeaways for today. Number one, we wanna build a deeper understanding of the darknets. Number two, we wanna learn stronger attribution management techniques. So we have a better understanding of how that might work uh, from a network and a technical perspective. And then number three, uh, create some automation for talk collection. And so we can start to build efficiencies into our, into our approach. And again, uh, like all of my talks, we look at some of the thematics and some of the things you can take away from a non-technical perspective at the start, through to investigations, through to more technical aspects towards the end. So there's something in this for everyone, and uh, I hope you all get something out of it. Okay, part one, let's jump straight into it. So Tor network and, and attribution particularly. So let's have a look at dark nets. Now, um, and the first start point is normally at this stage, you'd see an iceberg. But what we're going to look at is just understanding where dark nets sit. And so if we look at the internet as a whole, you know, we have surface web and clear net from a terminology perspective. And this is where you're getting general searching and web browsing, uh, anywhere where sites can be indexed by Google. And that's the general um, terminology that's used in this particular uh, part of the internet. Then we have deep web and you'll see it's notated by the little padlock there. And this is where there's restricted access. And what we mean by that is forums that aren't indexed, they could be behind a paywall or a, or a password protected, or could be closed chats. It could be your chat rooms uh, where people are interacting. It's where sites are not indexed by your regular search engines. And so that's what people refer to when they're talking about the deep web. Then we get to the dark web, but part of the dark web uh, is where we're seeing forums, trade. We actually see a lot of mirrors of surface websites. So there's mirrors of Twitter, there's Facebook down on the dark net or on Tor specifically, uh, through to your marketplace and forums for nefarious activity. But for that dark web, there's the network attribute, uh, network associations or the network concepts. And dark nets as a terminology can be anything from the onion router, there's other dark nets like I2P and even other types like Freenet. And we're not going to get into uh, all the detail of each of these networks. We're going to focus on Tor, which is the onion router today. But just be aware that there are multiple dark nets and they're a network inside a network or a network that lives on the internet. And there's more than just one. Tor is the most popular. And that's what we're going to focus on today, uh, where we're going to start to do some investigations and automations. But please um, investigate and, uh, and learn about those other dark nets uh, as part of your, your education pipeline. Okay, so let's understand Tor. Let's get comfortable with Tor. One of the key things is you know, the dark net being this uh, scary place that not everyone sort of knows about. Some people, uh, or, or uh, I imagine a large amount of people on this, on this uh, conference today will have a fairly good understanding of Tor. And then there'll be others who haven't been down and seen what's down there. And we're gonna look at how do we build some comfort levels when we're accessing Tor from a network perspective so we know what we're getting ourselves into and we can build effective management techniques around that. So the Tor network design, just very briefly, it's designed as an onion, um, you know, it comes the onion router and you're, you're routing your traffic through multiple nodes. And we're gonna break this down in a more digestible manner in, the, in sort of the next slide. But essentially at a macro on that graphic there, you can see that your, your connection uh, will bounce through a series of servers that will then pipe out your traffic to the endpoint being the web server hosting the content. 
So in, in, in the basics, you're bouncing your, net, your connection around a series of servers. What does that look like for you? So your connection. And you're going to see this graphic three times in this presentation for a very particular reason. When you connect, you connect to an, what's called an entry node, also called a guard. And again, we're talking specifically about the Tor network. Your connection is then passed to the relay node or to a relay node in the middle. And then your connection is passed to what's called an exit node. So there's three hops in that chain before it goes out and your content is requested from the web server. Then that information is passed back. And so that should build us a good understanding of how your connection works when you connect to Tor. What is actually occurring and where does it go? But you're going to see this graphic uh, three to, another two times in this presentation to explain some of the risks around that. Okay, so let's understand the network a little bit further. There's a site there, metrics.torproject.org, which provides analysis of the network. And it's a really good point when you need to, or a really good site when you need to investigate parts of the network. You can look at network activity tracking for users, servers, and traffic. Now, it's anonymized, as you would imagine, but a key part for it is looking at uh, macro activity. Because you can look at this, and again, we spoke about thematics at the start, uh, before we get into the technical stuff, what can you use uh, bulk uh, access for or, or looking at uh, user network analysis? What about macro trend shifts? Can you see sentiment in the civilian population? You know, trust in government. People go and use Darknet when, when things shift in um, geopolitical environments. And we've seen it through a number of events, you know, over the course of history. And we're going to look at a couple, you know, in, in this particular example. What about state actors? So rather than seeing a upshift in activity, what about a downshift where a state actor may be cutting off anonymous communication channels and they might want to implement risk control over uh, internal comms, um, noting that obviously the, the Tor project uh, was created to allow uh, anonymous communications in contested environments uh, from, from the US government and then it was put out uh, into the public and has now taken a life of its own. Can we measure per capita usage of dark web activity uh, to identify illicit trends? Now, there's a little bit of uh, uh, statistical analysis and macro collection there, but you can get all this data from this particular site. And things you can look at is where, which countries have the highest rates of darknet usage. And we went through all this and over the last three months, it looks around, you know, most countries have about 0.1% usage of uh, darknet connectivity per capita. Now, obviously that doesn't reflect the people who are actively on the internet um, uh, versus those who don't have access to the internet now. But from a per capita perspective, we can start to build an understanding of this. And you'll be surprised around uh, some of the countries that do have access and, and what that looks like. To search for it, if you click on the user button, you'll bring up a, a page like this. And on the right there, you can, again, you can filter via start date and end date and build graphs based on the countries that users are connecting from. And it picks up their source IP address. And then, uh, and so if you're using a VPN, obviously that can be obfuscated, uh, but this is where you can start to track macro activity. So let's look at this from an example. When we looked at Afghanistan um, in the period last year, there was this massive spike around April. What can we do to understand some of those ideas? We can just apply basic Google searching, some of our OSINT skills. What happened between April 1st and May 1st in Afghanistan? Remarks were, were made by the, um, uh, the US president around uh, pulling out of Afghanistan. Now, correlation uh, does not mean causation, but these are some things we can start to apply. And when you uh, look at the same activity from all of the tour traffic, when the Silk Road shutdown became prominent in the media, you can use this same approach to understand the spike in activity because the first thing people thought was, hey, can I actually go on the darknet and buy illegal stuff um, you know, with anonymity? And so that actually led to a spike in dark web activity, whether people were uh, looking into it or not. And then what about relays? You know, relays are an interesting part in the network where we can start to investigate these. So one of the, the sites there, uh, metrics.torproject.org, and you'll see the relay search down the bottom, but really useful if you need to find an entry guard. And we're gonna get into that uh, in just a moment on how we can configure our client a little bit more detail to protect ourselves. You can profile with metadata, number of relays per country. You might do profiling for your connection or you might be trying to understand a relay when investigating an IP address. Contact information, nicknames, there's temporal data. Now, a relay 
uh, can set up that information with whatever they want. But if you're investigating an IP address, this may be something you want to look into. Whether And then we're going to get into historical data for uh, relays and, and IP addresses as well. But if you get an IP address, this might be a start point. Now, if you go into the relay search, you can set flags. And on the flags, you'll be able to choose things like, is it a guard or an entry node? Is it a exit node? Uh, is it fast? The Tor network flags the relays for their characteristics. And then you can specify by country. So what if we want to investigate one of these relays? Start with a relay search. And again, this is a cursory idea of what you might be able to look into. We might be looking for a relay that's really fast, has been flagged as fast because we're doing our network reconnaissance and we want to um, start to control how we connect to the Tor network. It might be a consideration, which we'll get into. We might say, I want fast relays coming out of Germany. We can bring up these relays and you'll see that at the top there, we're just randomly going to choose the top one and we might want to understand the network that it sits on. So we can go into that relay. And again, this is a server that your traffic will pass through. We can go and look up the AS number to understand this particular relay in the network, just so we have an understanding of what actors are, uh, are, are relevant and what might be relevant to our access to the network. When we look at that AS number, we can see that there's 482 relays running on that network block. When we go and uh, Google that, we can see, okay, it's run by that particular organization um, and yeah, for the autonomous system number, and please go and Google an understanding of that, but we're talking about network blocks here. When we go and do that, we can bring up and we go and then pivot into the organization to understand where our traffic might be passing through. There's a Wikipedia page that has a lot of details about historical events, things like compromised monitoring systems on that particular network, uh, uh, activity related to geopolitical events and suppression of information uh, across a number of different areas. So you may want to avoid that relay when you're connecting to it or put in other protections for your particular connection to Tor. So we want to, again, key takeaway, building greater understanding of anonymity when we're connecting to Tor and what control we have over the network side. What about Tor exit nodes? You can go to that URL, check.torproject.org forward slash Tor bulk exit list. And it gives you a list of all of the IP addresses that are running as Tor exit nodes now. Be aware though, that when someone creates a new node, it doesn't automatically go onto the register immediately. So there may be a delay, there will be gaps in the data, uh, but as a start point, you know, network administrators will often use this list to block access and, and things like that, or understand if there's connectivity coming from a Tor uh, server or Tor, Tor network. What you can do though, and we want to look at this from an investigations point of view. If you go to exonerator.html on the back of the metrics site, you can look at historical activity for Tor relays within the network. So if we need to look at an IP address and say, hey, we had this IP address, where was that? Or was that part of the Tor network at a particular time? We can use this site and let's give you an example. 176.1099.200. If we went and looked at that on 21st of March this year, the immediate search results say, hey, this is not part of the Tor network anymore. So we might change our investigation approach. But if we go and look at historical data, we can see that a year ago, just over a year ago, it absolutely was. And then we can apply things like our um, OSINT techniques and look at things like nicknames. Are these things that we can pivot from? Are these things that form a different angle or a different perspective for our investigation when we're starting to look into IP addresses and understanding that? Okay, let's bounce into attribution. Now, remember I said we're gonna see this graphic a few times to reinforce uh, the idea. Your connection goes to the entry node, goes to the relay node, goes to the exit node. So you're passing through the network and then it comes back out. So what, why does that matter? Key point, the server, at the start, sees your originating IP address. Server at the end can see what you're browsing and requesting to a degree. Uh, and there's some things we can talk about, uh, which we will talk about when we get into this later. But key point here, the server you're connecting to at the start sees your originating IP address. Park that in the back of your mind as we go through uh, the rest of the presentation. Types of attribution that we're gonna talk about on the back of that. Network-based attribution, so IP addresses, systems, et cetera and then client user-based attribution. So Tradecraft and OSINT. And we're just going to touch on that briefly. When we look at the network attribution, 
attribution is relative to your requirements. There is extreme measures and there are measures that are relative to what you actually need to achieve. If a sophisticated actor uh, runs their own tour entry guards, they can harvest and connect who connects through to the tour network. If you saturate enough tour entry nodes, can you potentially profile IP ranges associated with an investigative body? These are things that you want to consider when you're connecting to the tour network. How are you protecting that initial start point? Hiding a connection should be key um, or it may be important, but again, it's going to be relative to your requirements. And we always talk about relativity uh, because not every security measure is, is required by every organization or individual. But why would it matter here? You might want to obfuscate that your agency is looking at darknet targets. You may uh, want cursory protection of government network infrastructure from bulk collection. Uh, if you're talking about this at a mass scale, Importantly, though, if you're communicating in a sensitive environment and you're worried about state actors persecuting you, you may not want to connect to the Tor network immediately with your home IP address that's attributable to you. Um, the chances are obviously going to be, uh, uh, there's an element of chance in how that's going to work. It doesn't mean that when you connect through that someone's definitely going to grab it because you need to buy chance connect to that actual um, uh, entry guard that's, that's harvesting the information but it could be relative to your requirements. So again, we're building a deeper understanding of network attribution here. So third time we'll see this graphic, let's look at the hypothetical. You connect to the entry node, the threat actor runs a relay and harvests your originating IP address. They reverse that to your organization's infrastructure or to you. What about it gets passed to the next point and then the exit node, threat actor runs an exit relay and they harvest every request coming through and they might do what's called like an SSL stripping attack where they will change HTTPS and replace it with HTTP and then pass your connection through and listen into your traffic. Now, that's obviously going to be relevant if you're accessing services. So if you're going into email and Facebook and things like that, which you shouldn't be doing on the dark net um, as, a matter of, as a matter of course. And that's where we get into client attribution. So we looked at network. Now we're looking at what happens from an individual, a human perspective. And um, whilst client attribution can be difficult to achieve, if you don't configure your client settings right, things like HTML5 Canvas fingerprinting, JavaScript embeds, basically malicious actors running the web service can use that as a potential identification point, or you could be connecting to a honeypot. Um, if you're accessing personal services uh, with an exit node watching, you know, these are things that you want to be aware of. So you want to avoid accessing anything related to you when you're connecting into Tor, uh, and you want to use it for its purpose, which is for anonymity and anonymous communication channels. But more importantly, normally when we're looking at from an outbound or investigative perspective, information slippage is key. And this is where attribution slips between surface deep and dark web. So where people use markers, such as usernames, email addresses, accounts, whatever they've got, they can be attributed on the, on the surface web. And so if we look at that from a concept, and there you go, it had to be a, an iceberg in here. Um, surface deep and dark web, you might have an onion site on Tor. It might have crypto addresses. So think about, uh, and, um, and Matt touched on it with the, the web 3.0 talk coming up. You know, what if, what if there's uh, uh, wallets? Obviously crypto is, uh, cryptocurrency is the trend, um, currency of choice on the dark net. And so how do we investigate wallets? What about links? And if we look at this cyber caliphate page on the dark net, which was there previously uh, from, from uh, ISIS, they had a Facebook presence that linked directly up to it. So now we can start to do things like harvest usernames, crypto addresses, PGP keys, and exploit poor user habits for leaked information. Looking at tools like what's my name, uh, username searching and start to do some of that associative investigation to build social networks and understand connections. So that's the concept around information slippage at a start point. What is an example of this? Now, Ben Strick, amazing. If you've never seen any of his work, uh, you're missing out. Go and check, check out the work he does. He's an incredible presenter and, and OSINT specialist. Um, but he wrote an article previously around looking at jihadi cryptocurrency pages. So we wanted to have a look at that and how information slippage might apply to the concept of where he started. And so Sadaka Coins was a uh, GoFundMe page for jihadi activity. And we looked at a particular one where it had a particular username um, that was propagating. We're like, okay, what information slippage might occur in this particular perspective? And so when we look at that username, just some basic Google searching starts to unravel the network. So we look at 
uh, Twitter accounts are associated using basic tools like Mention Map for social network analysis uh, for frequency of, of engagement. We start to pull out other markers like Telegram channels that are starting to be used and associated with this organization. We then exploit social media algorithms because they recommend who to follow and who your friends should be because they look at all those networks behind you. And this is where driving your personas to build that depth can be a really important uh, tactic when you're, when you're doing sock puppet management, which we can talk about at another stage. Um, but it'll link you directly to individuals potentially associated with the same thematics or same uh, content that, that you're leading into. And this is how we can start to build into these different areas. So that is just a real life example of how you can uh, conduct or how information slippage works. All right, so what can we do? How do we protect ourselves? We've got network attribution, we've got client attribution, all these different concepts. What are some of the risks? Tiered protection. So we're gonna look at tiered protection for connection to the darknet. The first one is pretty simple uh, and, uh, and definitely one of the, the safer options is have a standard computer, connect to a, a cloud provider and spin up a virtual machine in the cloud to run your Tor activities. Amazon, Digital, um, uh, DigitalOcean, Azure, Google, it's very simple. There's a great company called Chasm that has um, remote browser instances. You can spin up instances very simply and have standoff between your machine and out into the broader, uh, uh, broader networks that you might be investigating. Another way you can do it is to install a local virtual machine like the Trace Labs VM or download your own, have your VPN running, connect out to the internet and conduct your Tor activities that way. Just be aware of how you configure, say, VirtualBox and you're getting your NATing right so you don't inadvertently expose your home IP address. And then a more expensive approach is having a dedicated research laptop where you obviously have to wipe it all the time, starting fresh, uh, but it can give you obviously that ultimate level of standoff you just need to take into account all those different aspects around um, uh, time and efficiency with always having to manage that. So that's the basics of how you might connect safely. Let's look at advanced dark web connection options. Now, we're gonna look at a number of tiers here. The first one is hiding in plain sight, using a VPN or a non-associated IP address before you connect to the Tor network. But you might not bother because this level of control may not be required for you. Again, relative attribution requirements. The second part is what if you choose a Tor entry node you're comfortable with? What if you know a Tor relay node um, that you've done your investigations on, you're comfortable with the network? You might choose to go through that. Remember, every time you, you start to isolate down to uh, uh, entry and exit nodes, you're reducing your anonymity because you're creating a pattern of life. So just be aware of that, but this is an option. A third approach might be setting up your own Tor entry relay if you need to control it and you might get sophisticated around um, and again, there's a lesson for another time, cycling Tor uh, entry nodes that you can connect to and how you might set that up to at least have control over that start point uh, for your organization or for yourself. Easiest access on the left, most control on the right. What does this actually look like? You configure your Tor client, you say, I wanna to connect to a relay you control and you route your traffic through those endpoints. Another approach is configure your Tor client to a relay you trust, no change to your routing, and then the third one is use your default settings with a VPN where you connect to any relay uh, and your, route, your traffic gets routed through. So there's three approaches for how you can start to look at advanced dark web connection options. And again, this is to stimulate ideas, not to give you the playbook on how you should do it. You need to apply it based on your relative requirements. And that's a really key part because everyone's going to be different. Same applies to exit nodes, but it carries additional risk and we're not going to get into or advise on, on setting up exit nodes and some of the different aspects there. But setting up a Tor entry node is very simple. Uh, but again, lesson for another day. If we have a Tor relay that we want to connect to, how do we do client configuration? Well, first part is to install Tor, go to torproject.org, download Tor, and then make sure you configure your settings. So go to your options, go to privacy and security, and set your browser to safest. Always have that as a start point. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. We want to look at how do we configure it. So close your Tor browser down and browse to this folder and you want to find the TORRC file. And this is going to allow us to specify where we connect to the Tor network. Find the file and you just need to add some commands to it. And the first one is if you want to say, I want to connect to only Tor relays in a particular country. I want all of my traffic to route out through a particular country. Put in the comment, entry nodes, then in squiggly brackets, 
the country uh, ISO 2 code for it, so US or AU or AS, depending on your country, and then strict nodes space one. And that's going to say to Tor browser, only connect to relays, both entry and exit in this instance, or you can obfuscate one or the other through those countries. Be strict about it. Or you can specify an exact entry node. So you can put an IP address of an entry or an exit node for what you want to connect to. Remember, thinking back, we can set up our own Tor relay. We could specify here, hey, I only want to connect through to that particular entry node that I've set up. I control it. I'm comfortable with it. If you do it on Windows and Linux, that's where the file is. Browser, Tor, browser, data, Tor. If you're on Mac OS, it's in another location. But check out support.torproject.org for more details. Now, this is a live example of uh, how you do it. On the left, we're just going to use a very rudimentary example of how you might find a relay. Uh, again, by doing this, you're going to start to reduce your anonymity uh, because you're setting a pattern. But it's to give you the idea or an example of how you would configure it. In this case, we're going to look for uh, particular relays that are entry guards coming out of the US. We're going to find one, and then we're going to configure our browser to do it. Again, building the knowledge so then if we do run our own Tor relays, how do we actually go and um, configure the client to do it? So we go into Tor Browser, we go to Browser. This is where it's installed. We go to Tor Browser again, go to the Data folder, go to Tor and find that Torque file. Now, if you're on Linux, you can just type find uh, T-O-R-C um, and you should be able to find the file and then you go and configure it. And all we're gonna do here is say, add that node in there and say, entry nodes with an S and then just copy that IP address with the port at the end of it, copy, Paste that in there. And then what this is telling us once we save this file is go and connect through to that particular entry node. And again, we can do the same for exit nodes. Uh, we can do it for if we're trying to find fast networks. But remember, we looked at that particular uh, relay in Germany before that was fast, but also potentially a point of compromise. So just think about those things uh, and how we can uh, control uh, some of our access a little bit more, or at least understand how we can control it. So here I'm specifying a IP address for an exit relay that I've identified. And we're saying exit nodes and I'm putting that IP address in. Just for clarity, we're not advocating for these particular relays at all. These are just random ones we chose um, uh, to demonstrate. And then once you've saved that file, just connect in. And then what we, we can do is we can go and browse uh, to a site and we can start to see what that network looks like or where our traffic is routing to. And you'll see the first thing I'm doing though is I'm changing my security settings and I'm changing it to safest, just so I've always got a level of protection there. So we're gonna to go to Amiya.fi, which is a search engine, and we're gonna go and see where our traffic routed through. So we bring that over and we bring up the talk file just for comparative analysis. And on the left there, I click on the padlock and it tells me where my traffic is routing through. And this is the key part, because we can see that the IP addresses line up for both the entry guard then it routes through Poland and then it goes out through that entry node. So at least my, I know where my originating IP address is, is, is sending itself to. And if we had our own entry node, entry node or entry relay, um, we could set up and start to control that. Or at least we have a good understanding of what's happening when we connect to the network and we may just use a VPN to protect ourselves a little bit further. Okay, so that's a little bit understanding about the network. We're going to get into part two now. And I hope that set the baseline for understanding what your signature looks like when you connect to the Tor network. Let's get into scraping and automation. But first, we need to look at what we're going to start to scrape. So exploring the darknet, a note on uh, version three addresses. And the reason why I bring this up, it relates to what you might be setting up in your automation pipeline. Uh, in, in September 2021, addresses moved from version two to version three. Without going to all the details, version three, essentially more secure, uh, additional layers of encryption. But for, for the end user, the depiction is when it's a version three, you'll see a 56 character length Tor address. So it looks like this down the bottom, as opposed to the version two at the top. The key takeaway is if you're uh, scraping search results or you're scraping sites and you're like, hey, my results aren't coming back, just ask yourself, is it a version two address? And you'll be able to quickly tell that based on literally the size of the URL. And use bookmarks. They're your friends. Now we're at 56 characters. Remembering URLs can be quite challenging. Okay, Tor services. There's a lot of directories and lists. This is just an example of a few. 
Um, we're not going to jump on and show you all the, 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 the different corners of the dark web and where you can find interesting stuff. This talk is about understanding networks and understanding scraping opportunities. But when we look at tour lists, they're a good index. And one of the questions you might say is, how can I keep an eye on all these lists? I've got 20 lists. How does every day I can keep an eye on the, the URLs and make sure they're up to date without having to go in there every day and actually look at them and click on them? So we can put that in the back of your mind for scraping. Then look at Tor search engines, free search engines. There's a heap, Amiya, Torch, Kilos, Tor66, Onionland, Phobos, Haystack, and more. If we want to search across all these, because every search engine will have different results, because uh, just like when you compare Google to Bing, they've all got different results. It's how do we aggregate those to create a meta search or a meta output for what we actually want to achieve? How can I aggregate all of the search results daily? And this is a key part you want to be asking yourself. How do I monitor lists? How do I aggregate search results? How do I create efficiency in what I'm doing? So let's look at monitoring and scraping. First approach uh, uh, from a perspective is scraping search engine results. How do I create an aggregated approach to efficiency? Or what if you have a particular site that you're targeting? It's a particular vendor. It's a particular malicious actor that you want to keep an eye on. That's where you can start to do uh, targeting, scraping. We can apply the same techniques here. One is aggregated and broad monitoring. The other one is targeted. Now, again, when you're scraping a specific site, you might have a list of different sites, but they're very specific. And that's where you want to start to create efficiencies. A couple of approaches. You can use GUI scraping tools, which we're going to demonstrate today. You can use SaaS platforms like Appify and other tools to do it. And then you can build your own tools, which we won't have too much time to get into today. Um, but this is the approach we might take. So if we look at this, when you search for something, we want to just construct the URL around it. And so you'll see here, I've got URLs, and I'm just grabbing the URLs at the end of each of these search results. And they're all a little bit different. And I'm just going to skip forward a little bit in the uh, interest of time here, because what we can start to do is grab all those and build our search list. And our search list looks something like this on the right-hand side. Then all I've got to do is modify the search term at the end of the actual uh, search result. And I can start to build my list for scraping. Okay, quick word on ClearNet to Tor proxies before we get into this. Um, if you add .ly to any Onion address, you can access Tor without being on the Tor network. You can do it through your ClearNet browser. There are other services, but none of them seem to uh, be up at the moment. But .ly on the end of an Onion address, and you'll see the example there, .onion.ly, it'll act as a bridge service so you can get to Tor sites or Onion addresses without Tor service. Something important though, use only in a clean environment because you don't want to pass uh, data through. You don't want to be infected by malware or any malicious actors. And you only want to use a clean browser, but it's useful if you're setting up a clean browser with an environment for scraping. So how do we set up scraping? So we can get a list of query URLs, which we mentioned. You can add .ly on the end of them. If, it's, if, you, if you're doing it in a clean environment, you don't have Tor infrastructure set up. And a really great tool is one called Passhub, which is what we're going to look at now. Passhub.com, install it in a clean environment like a Trace Labs VM or any, any Linux virtual machine, or if you have a Windows virtual machine, just set it up in there, create your task and schedule your, your scraping. That URL at the bottom is a walkthrough of exactly what we're going to cover off in the next um, sort of demonstration. So if you get lost, take a screenshot of that or, or, or ask me in the hallway afterwards. More than happy to share. Okay, so this is a clean virtual machine. You'll see there I'm running it in VirtualBox. Um, I, it's on Linux. I'm going to passhub.com and I'm going to step you through setting this up. So we go to passhub.com. We download uh, the particular file. In this case, I'm doing Linux. And even if you're not familiar with Linux, it's still a very simple process. They've done a great job of getting this, um, uh, lowering the barrier to entry for this. You can just load up a terminal and just copy the install commands across. In this case, top one here, I'm going to copy that across uh, into my terminal. It's going to go and download the particular uh, files I need uh, for the platform for PassHub itself. I then go and copy the actual uh, run command, uh, uh, sorry, some of the other commands to get the environment set up. And then the final one, and then all I've got to do after that is run passhub.com. So the environment set up, we run passhub, the correction passhub as a command, brings up the, the scraping environment. I'm gonna step through what this might look like. 
Now, the first part when we come in is going to ask you for a username and password. You can set up with a non-attributable account. You'll see I've just put John and John at noemail.com and just a dummy password. And it just lets me straight in. But it will send your data or that data up to their service. So just be aware of that from an attribution perspective um, and just keeping that in the back of your mind, particularly if, you, if you're accessing the darknet. In this case, I'm just going to build my URL list. Now, I know how Amia, um, the search engine Amia.fi, uh, uh, builds its URLs. So I create a URL list and I go Amia.fi forward slash search forward slash question mark Q equals and then my search term. And I'm simply going to replicate that for all of my search terms. I'm going to search for vaccine, COVID, and the word buy. And I might put whatever I want to uh, keep an eye on for people selling goods, I might search for the word buy. I save that as a CSV, dump that into, into my folder, uh, and then I can go into um, Passhub and start to use that particular file. So in Passhub, we create a new project and we go start new project from that URL. And then what I need to do is load in that, that list of URLs. So I go to settings, I then go into uh, down the bottom and I import that CSV, which is gonna give me my stack. Now remember, there's uh, I can share the link for how to step step through this, but this is to demonstrate how this works in the efficiency. For each of those URLs now, I need to go and create a loop. And I say, go through and for each URL as an item uh, from that list I imported, I want to go and extract the link from that. So I create a new option and I say, begin new entry. And I say, with that entry, I'm going to call that, this is the list of links. For each of the links, I then need to extract the actual URL. So I create a command called extract and I just call that link. So that is my, my link. And down the bottom here, it's the item from the first part. And again, uh, stepping through this in slow time uh, will, make, will make more sense. So now I've got that particular item. I now need to say, what am I going to do with that? So I go and create a template. And I say for each of those URLs or those links that I've extracted from that list, I can just type that in and say link, and it's going to pull out that variable. I say create a new template, and I just call it results because this is what I'm going to do with the data. And I say create new template. And then I go forward and the next thing I need to do is say, okay, when I find that link in that list, what do I do with it? And the beauty of this URL or this GUI is I can just click on different elements and it does all the cascading style sheet extraction or XPath extraction for me. And all those green boxes are the bits that all the information I'm going to pull out as well as the URL associated underneath. So it pulls out the hyperlink. Once I've set that up, I literally just save it, go back and I've got my project and I say, get data. And then it will go and run and I'll just skip forward for the process. It takes about 20 seconds, depending on how many sites. I'm scraping three aggregated search results for COVID vaccine and buy as keywords. And if I just skip forward, you'll see the results you get presented with is a uh, CSV, you have a JSON file or an API. Obviously JSON file, great to work with uh, within your particular environment. Uh, if you're doing dev tool uh, development, you can also use the API directly as a service if you want to create that level of efficiency and buy into this particular tool. Or you can open up the CSV, uh, which is obviously from a daily list perspective is very useful to work with. If you do open it up, just be aware, if you get presented with that, change the character set to UTF-8, and then you'll get your list of data. And you'll see here, really useful list. I've scraped all of those results. I haven't had to go through one by one. I've got all the URLs, uh, all the redirect URLs on the right. And you can see the different search results. So I've, I've scraped over 400 search results with a click of a button. And then my daily routine might be to come into Passhub, go to projects and literally click get data. And that is it. That is the simplicity of setting up GUI based searching. And again, hit me up in the hallway. I'll talk, I can uh, share some more details. There are other approaches. There are other tools out there. This is just a free and simple tool that you could get running really quickly. Advanced scraping, build your own tools. I gave a talk on that last year as a, as a start point and you can sort of extend from there. And that could be everything from just aggregating search links um, from a click of a button through to actually uh, scraping data through proxies. There's some great Python based ones around uh, using beautiful soup and some of the modules um, or go to oxylabs.io and they've got a really good blog on, on getting started with Python web scraping. And they also have a service as well, but giving things out for free is really great for the community. So understanding how we can do advanced scraping. 
There's also a lot of command line tools. What about using scrappy.org or some of the other tools out there? There's a lot of good tools. Again, this is a start point to show how we can lower the barrier to entry for automating and creating efficiency in scraping. Just important though, only scraping and extracting text initially, and then using a clean and isolated system. Obviously, if you're scraping images, you may advance into doing hashing and starting to get into that, but you want to avoid having cached images of nefarious activity on your system because you don't want to be liable for, for different areas. And again, all of these activities operate and uh, within your own legal uh, boundaries and your own mandates and seek guidance and advice on what you can and can't do to do some of this work. But importantly, consider your network attribution. All right, so to wrap all this up, we talked about networks, attribution from a network perspective. We understand networks a little bit better. We understand events and we understand informed access. What is relative to your requirements? Services and searching, what's out there? Not from how do we go and find cool stuff on the dark net. It's think about how you can create automation to keep an eye on different things from an investigations point of view. So when you're looking at lists, parking those URLs in the back of your mind to again, create scraping and monitoring uh, opportunities. Now we've covered a lot uh, in this particular presentation, but the key takeaways are uh, the dark net, it's a hive of illegal activity. So consider your access approach and misattribution requirements and your legal uh, mandates. But automation can be fairly simple. Just plan your requirements and find the most suitable approach to what you're doing. Um, but that's really it, wrapping up those, those different areas. So I hope you got something out of today uh, from a thematic looking at the networks and geopolitical events through to some technical ideas that you can then take forward and start to expand further. There's my contact information. If you're interested in anything from our training site or our Net Nexus Explore platform, please reach out. Um, but just at, right at the end of time there, I'll pause there, Matt, and um, hand back to you for any questions that have come through.